started. Um, and I'm just going to pause for a moment because we're going to be recording today's webinar. So um, I know Tora and our Zoom extraordinaire is getting our audio um, <laughs> recording set up. So Tora, as soon as you give us the thumbs up, Heather will take it away. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, we're so glad that you're able to join us today, and we hope that you're all staying safe and healthy and definitely sane uh, during these times. I'm sure everyone's coming up with creative ways to keep themselves and their family members occupied. Um, so I'm Heather Burns, and um, Alyssa kindly invited me to kick things off today by providing a minute or so of some framing. And then I'll, I'll sort of hand it off to our amazing lineup of panelists. So like I said, I'm Heather Burns. I'm founder and CEO of the Connecticut Sustainable Business Council. And for those of us who are viewer who are not um, familiar, we are a nonprofit organization that represents a growing community of purpose-driven businesses. Heather, I lost you. I did too. I did too. We lost your sound. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yep. Okay. I think I got muted somehow. Um, well, where should I, <laughs> where should I pick up? You were talking about the growing business community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we're, we're a growing community of purpose-driven business leaders in Connecticut who are using the power of business to meet the challenges of a climbing cha or changing climate and building a sustainable and equitable economy in the state. Procurement has been at the core of our activities and what we do because, you know, as you are most likely aware, how money flows through the system and through the economy has a direct impact on our planet and, and people. Some of you might be surprised that Connecticut's actually leading the way um, on the issue of sustainable procurement, but after you hear from our panelists today, I think you'll agree that we are definitely taking this issue to heart in our communities. So we thought it was important today to provide you all with a range of um, perspectives and people involved in sustainable procurement. And after Alyssa gives you some background on sustainable CT, we'll hear from Ann Hulick at Clean Water Action Connecticut a little bit about the importance of chemicals in purchasing. Um, and then Howard Brown um, from the town of Guilford will share how they approached developing a sustainable purchasing policy. And then we'll have um, Mike, Mike Tangray from EBP Supply Solutions, a family owned business here in Connecticut. And he'll talk a little bit about some of the products that are available um, that are safer to use and maybe some of the things you might want to be thinking about when considering them. Followed by Rebecca Munich at the Ecology Center, who's going to discuss some really exciting resources and next steps um, available to you as you move forward. So before I hand it off, I just want to give a big shout out to Sustainable CT. Thank you for providing this space for us today. And you're doing just such amazing work, you know, by providing Connecticut municipalities with a framework for resilience and sustainability. Thank you so much, Heather. So glad to be here. Bear with me for just one moment while I get my screen shared with all of you. Hopefully everybody can see it and we'll queue up to the beginning of the slides. So you get to see the whole thing in reverse really quick. Um, so as Heather mentioned, my name is Alyssa Norwood and I am with Sustainable CT. I know folks have um, varying functionality. Some have called in, some have access to their chat box and some don't. But for those who have access to their chat box, obviously this is a different forum than we're used to. And if I were in a room, I'd ask folks who is involved in Sustainable CT. So I'll ask folks to use the chat box and please type in um, what's your connection to sustainable CT are you new and hearing about it for the first time are you part of a registered community part of a certified community so I'd love to see your responses so feel free to go ahead and type them in and you can get a sense um, 
from your peers who's in the virtual room, if not in the actual one. Um, for those who are not familiar with Sustainable CT, we are a program managed by Eastern Connecticut State University, which is where I work. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of different partners who have made Sustainable CT um, possible from its inception to its current highly successful implementation. So our three founding funders are the Smart Seed Fund, the Common Sense Fund, and the Emily Hall Tremaine foundation and we have a growing number of funders who have joined them and are grateful to all of them for their commitment and another key partner in addition to the program again being managed by um, the Institute for Sustainable Energy at Eastern Connecticut State University the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities is a continued partner that allows um, for an incredible recognition event among other things at which all of our certified municipalities um, achieve uh, their recognition and earn their sustainable CT plaque. So what is sustainable CT for folks who are new to it? Um, sustainable CT is a voluntary certification program for Connecticut municipalities that's grounded in a number of principles, um, the key of which is that the program is by towns for towns. And we had a number of municipalities that served on the original Connecticut Conference of Municipalities Sustainability Task Force that outlined these mm -hmm. guiding principles, which continue to, to help inform form our work. So one which is highlighted here is that the program is highly flexible. It's meant to um, provide a pathway toward certification for every town in Connecticut from the largest to the smallest, from urban to rural, coastal to inland, and so on. Um, in addition to providing the certification, there's an incredible amount of support in Sustainable CT, a number of resources, and the program is really one of partnership. So uh, among other things, we have a highly successful fellows program where we have Connecticut undergraduates and graduate students that support municipalities through their work at the councils of government every summer and help prepare an application among many other resources. And all of this leading to the goal, of course, of creating more thriving, resilient, and sustainable communities. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, our vision and mission at our, on our website, you can reference them at your leisure, so I won't read them to you, but all this is to say that we have a really broad conception of what it is to be sustainable that of course encompasses environmental sustainability, but also looks at sustainability um, in a broader context and includes um, other pillars. Equity is a really important part of our program as is economic sustainability. So if you check out our website, you can find out more in terms of the breadth of our program and our definition of sustainability. Um, we have nine different categories in our program that sort of typify that breadth, and you can see them all right here. Our focus today, of course, is sustainable procurement, which resides in the first of our nine categories, um, which sets forth a vision of thriving local economies. So how does sustainable procurement get you there? We'll talk about that shortly. But first, I just wanted to talk about the incredible breadth of participation in our program and my personal excitement, because every one of these towns represents a place and an opportunity to go further with sustainable procurement. Um, we actually now have 104 registered municipalities um, as of a short time ago, our slide's a little out of date, but a significant portion of the state and diverse geographies are all part participating in our program. And of those 104 registered communities over the first two years, the program has existed, 47 have achieved one of two levels of certification, mm -hmm. either bronze or silver is denoted by the different color pins on the map. So how does a community that isn't already become a sustainable CT community through several different steps? The first of which, which achieve, affords you registration, is the community needs to pass a resolution that either establishes a sustainability team or repurposes an existing group um, to focus on the task of pursuing sustainable CT certification. You then submit those documents online and your community is registered. Um, you then go through the process of taking a look at all of our actions, which of course includes sustainable procurement, see which ones you've already completed, which ones you might be interested in pursuing using our various tools and technical assistance. Of course, having equity as a pillar of our program, 
beginning work uh, at the onset with um, our Optimize for Equity action and the toolkit therein that allows you to take any action in our program and then go through a process that makes sure that you have openness, inclusivity, and are really thinking about making sure you're reaching everyone in your community, implementing the various actions, and then, of course, we hope achieving certification. Um, so to achieve certification in our program at this time, we currently offer two levels of certification. One is bronze and one is silver, and it requires that you complete at least one action in each of those nine categories. So sustainable procurement, um, implementing a policy, or engaging in today's training or a similar training would allow you to meet the local economy's requirement, in addition to other requirements that are outlined here. And one of the things that we're most proud of in our program is it's a program that has many benefits associated with it. And really specifically, we gave great thought in our program um, to make sure that any action that it was included in it would allow a community to realize multiple benefits. So sustainable procurement certainly fits into that framework in that it, there are multiple benefits that it realizes, some of which are listed here. So if you were to go on our website um, to our actions page, you would come upon these nine categories. And if you were to click on thriving local economies, you would find a list of actions, one of which would be our sustainable purchasing action. So all of the actions in sustainable CT are um, crafted similarly and have the same framework. So you can see on the far left, there are a bunch of hyperlinks that take you to different components of the action. And the heart of our conversation today is going to be that hyperlink that says what to do, that walks a community through um, the various steps that would allow a municipality to earn points with regard to sustainable purchasing. So one of the two items is to participate in the training. So if you are a municipal elected official or a municipal staff member or a commission member and you're participating in today's sustainable procurement training on behalf of your municipality and are able to share back what you've learned, you've just earned five points for your town in sustainable CT if you meet the submission requirements. So well done on being here. And then, of course, why, why learn about sustainable procurement? Well, the hope and the goal is that ultimately, as a community, you'll adopt a sustainable purchasing policy, and you'll hear more about that from some of our other panelists shortly. Um, we're really pleased and proud at the number of municipalities that are beginning to look more deeply at sustainable purchasing. Um, there are a number of different topics in sustainable purchasing policies that we encourage you to address, and those are outlined more clearly in the action. So what are those? Um, there are different social impact areas as well as environmental impact areas and keeping true to the notion of flexibility in our program, we ask that you select from this list the social impact areas and environment, envir environmental impact areas that are most resonant for your community. Obviously, in, uh, in this instance, more is probably better, but starting somewhere is also really important. Um, so again, they're listed here and we also have models on our website that show you um, what other communities have done so that you can consider what might be right for your own community. And then finally, um, once you've actually adopted your policy implementation, of course, is the ultimate goal. So for any community that has a sustainable purchasing policy in place, there are points available if you're able to provide an estimate of what percentage of your, of your municipal budget actually was used to purchase um, sustainable goods and services with some conversation about that. So sustainable CT provides a pathway and a framework for peer learning among municipal municipalities that are interested in this. For any community um, that's achieved certification and earned points for this action, you can take a look at their sustainable purchasing policy on our website. And then going beyond Connecticut, if you go into the action, we have models um, in other states. So we hope that you'll use the sustainable CT framework as a platform um, and a springboard for pursuing this important endeavor. And then finally, the last piece where there's an opportunity to earn points is if, you've, if you develop and maintain an up-to-date list that includes special designations for your vendors, there's an opportunity to earn points as well here. So not only having a vendor list, which we know a lot of towns do, but adding designations to it so that there's um, 
uh, an in-house knowledge, a store of knowledge for which of the businesses on that list are locally owned and which ones are eco-friendly and which ones are perhaps minority or women owned and slowly, slowly moving your municipality toward a space where those businesses um, perhaps get some preferential treatment in the procurement process. So with that, I want to uh, pass off to some of our other presenters who have a lot of great information to share, but there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end of the webinar. And if you'd like to find out more about Sustainable CT, you can visit our website at sustainablect.org or email us at info at sustainablect.org. Um, so with that, it'll be my great pleasure to pass off shortly to my colleague, Ann Hulick. Thank you, Alyssa. And you're, I don't see my slides up on the screen, but they're, they're coming. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and, and start. Um, I want to thank you, Alyssa, and, and all our colleagues at Sustainable CT, um, Heather Burns, um, Becca from the Ecology Center, and all the folks on this line um, who are participating and also listening in to learn more about procurement. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so Alyssa, that is my last slide. I don't just wanna flag if you could go to the first one, if you can. Um, so I'm Ann Hulick. I'm the Connecticut Director of Clean Water Action and Clean Water Fund. And um, I'm really honored to be here with you today. And you may be asking me, well, why is Clean Water Action working on procurement? And the, you know, very briefly, the reason is that we're part of a, a large national coalition with safer states um, and really looking at how do we prevent pollution to water and to the environment and and also pollution that impacts public health so in that work we recognize that toxic chemicals are a, a very big problem and we learned about the value of procurement policies in terms of really making workplaces and businesses more sustainable and protecting not only employee health but public health, and reducing pollution to our environment. So I want to give you a very high level, fast overview of best practices in sustainable procurement and not forgetting chemicals. So next slide, please, please. So it's really important to include chemicals in sustainable procurement policies. And this is not something that has, has traditionally been done, but it's really, really important. And you as procurement and town officials can have a huge impact. Um, so it's a tough area for procurement officials and for all of us, frankly, because unless you have a PhD in chemistry, it's really hard to know all of the chemicals and the classes and the names and what they cause. Uh, and there is no way to keep up with that. So my goal here is today is to give you a very quick high level overview of how we can make it easy for towns to um, in Connecticut and beyond to really continue their leadership in including chemicals in sustainable purchasing policies. So the two reasons are that chemicals in, pro um, just go back one second, yep, thank you. Um, the two reasons are the health impacts. So we now know um, through many years of research that the chemicals in products that we use every day that are in, in our workplaces are very strongly linked to um, public health concerns, namely um, respiratory problems, they disrupt our hormones, many are linked to cancers, many are neurotoxic. So the chemicals in our products that we're purchasing can be harmful to human health and harmful to the employees um, that are working in your towns. There's also a huge environmental impact. So at the end of life, these products, whether it's office furniture or um, you know, flooring products, they get discarded and they get incinerated or put into a landfill. And those chemicals get into our soil and our environment or in our air emissions. 
um, impacting our water quality. So it's a very huge issue um, and you as procurement officials can make a huge difference. So next slide. Thank you. So um, thanks to my colleagues at um, the Center for Environmental Health and the Ecology Center and SAFER, we're trying to really focus on the five classes of chemicals that um, make it easier for procurement officials to focus in on as they're thinking about procurement policies. And you'll see these five here, and I'm gonna go through them each very rapidly and um, talk a little bit about why these five are the most important. Next slide. So the first is flame retardants. And you may think that flame retardants sound like a good idea, but they are actually very toxic chemicals that do not um, effectively retard flames. We know now that they're linked to many cancers, reproductive disorders, they're found in furniture and textiles. And the good thing is that um, in California, many years ago in 2013, they adopted a new standard for furniture, a technical bulletin 117-2013, that has a label requirement on all furniture um, sold and made and sold in California, um, that you'll see this label on the right-hand side. And what we're looking to um, do is purchase all office furniture or any furniture, any textiles without flame retardants because again, they're not effective and they're highly toxic. So you'll see this label on some of the products distributed in California, which has become kind of a de facto standard. So companies actually have to make an, a check mark in that label. Um, if they've added the flame retardants or not. And what, what makes it easy for you as purchasing professionals and town officials is to just make sure that you're requesting uh, furniture that is compliant with this standard without chemical flame retardants. So next slide. So the next um, category is antimicrobials, also often um, referred to as antibacterials. And these are soaps, uh, cleansing wipes, all of those kinds of things that contain uh, chemicals that are resistant to infections. And the reason this is a concern is that one, they're being extremely overused. They're used in so many products and it's actually contributed to bacterial resistant infections. So unless you really need antibacterial products, if you're a hospital or a clinic, um, really soap and water is the best. And the fact that the chemicals in these products get into our environment, um, again, leads to many additional health and environmental problems. So to the extent that you can, we don't want to just automatically be purchasing antimicrobial or antibacterial products. Next slide. So the next uh, class of chemicals is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. And I'm sure many of you have heard about PFAS chemicals. There are a class of over 5,000 different chemical variations linked to kidney and testicular cancers, um, liver disease, reproductive disorders. You can see the list here on the slide. They're found in a variety of um, um, items, but most important for procurement professionals, I think, are food packaging and food serviceware, um, textiles, so you'll see the stain resistant carpeting, firefighting foam. Um, they're basically used to make things anti-grease, anti-water resistant, anti-stain. And while they're very effective for what they do, um, these chemicals are not only linked to very serious diseases, but they don't break down in the environment and um, they get into our bodies, stay there for a long time, and then get into the environment once these products 
many of which are single use products um, when these products are disposed of. So an extremely important measure that you can think about as procurement officials is restricting PFAS in items that you might be purchasing for your towns. And next slide. So the next category is um, of hazardous um, chemicals is volatile organic compounds, and that includes formaldehyde. And these classes of chemicals are found in so many products, frankly. Um, they're in flooring, they're in furniture, they're in wood um, laminate um, products, and um, they are linked to many serious diseases. So next slide. Plastics, we just want to put a plug in to any opportunity that you can reduce plastics is extremely important. And I think you all know that, so I'll move to the next slide. And I wanted to just wrap up with, there's a huge amount of resources now available to all of you. Um, not only can I be a local resource here in Connecticut, but um, there are third party certifications like BPI and Green Screen. The Center for Environmental Health has a huge resource of materials and fact sheets and technical language for procurement officials. So we're here to help you and make sure that, again, Connecticut is a leader in procurement. You've all done a great job. We're really pleased with that. And we're here to help. So there's so many things out there to make it easy for you. And I want to thank you all for participating today. Great, Anne. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to turn things over to Howard. So Howard, take it away. Okay, so I don't uh, actually have any slides uh, that um, I thought were the best way to share with you. I just want to share some experience uh, that might be helpful and um, a plead for some assistance. But I want to start by saying, Anne, that was uh, really fantastic. Um, uh, uh, and I know that um, Terry Kane, who's the chair of our Sustainable Guilford Task Force, uh, is on the is on the line, and I'm sure that she was thinking the same thing I was, which is how do we get uh, that information to um, not just our purchasing agent, but to all the town departments and actually to the citizens of of Guilford, because um, it's really really important. Um, so we'll be in contact with you, Ham. Um, so. Uh, I just want to start by saying that uh, I think the reason Heather invited me to do this is because I'm the chair of the purchasing committee or procurement committee of the Guilford Sustainable Task Force, and uh, and we have a we have a small group of seven people who are just extraordinary individuals with backgrounds in a, a number of related uh, activities and and who are just unbelievably energetic and relentless in their efforts to make things happen. And the task force is committed not only to changing the way that the, in, 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 terms of, um, in terms of purchasing, not only to change the way that the town buys materials, but we also really want to share uh, with businesses to learn from local businesses, uh, but also to share what we know with those businesses. And we've reached out and started doing that. Um, now, in a, um, uh, a little, I want to be contrite here for a minute. So in, in a way, um, it's, uh, it's ironic that we uh, in Guilford have gotten a, a lot of attention for our purchasing uh, work because um, uh, we really, it, it depends on how you look at it, we haven't done that much. Um, but we have learned a lot. And uh, so I want to share exactly how it happened that we got to the point that we are. Um, and the first thing is, is that we have a very supportive town administration that is committed to the environment, that really cares. Um, and when the task force, uh, um, the, the administration, the first selectman, Matt Hoey, appointed um, this task force and said, I really want you to do something. I want to know what we should be doing and I want to implement it. And 
Uh, he got the task force approved and unanimously bipartisan basis um, from the Board of Selectmen. And, um, uh, and we began our work. The first thing that year that we spent was mostly uh, working for the sustainable CT certification. Um, and we worked very hard for it. But there's some things that are unique and interesting and that might be helpful to share. So one of them is, of course, uh, it depends on the administration. Different towns have different situations and different times, and we know what that's like. Um, it wasn't long ago that we had to, that if you had a good idea in town, you had to fight for a year to even get the attention of people to do it. And now that's changed radically. But um, there's some things that are about Guilford that make our task force activities um, uh, work. And it's more than just the town itself. The town has a history of, of working, of the town government working with nonprofits and a variety of community organizations and relying on them and providing support in a variety of ways so that um, uh, the town supports activities and helps, but often is not actually doing them. So in the case of this, we have a procurement officer, whom I'll talk in a second, who uh, did participate actively in doing this um, in, in our procurement policy. But it started with the task force. We decided that procurement was one of the areas that we were to focus on after we got our silver certification. And uh, the first thing that happened was uh, we decided that to start uh, educating and working with the heads of the town. So we asked uh, if uh, he changed that, and he said, "It's perfect. Of it, you'll you'll have a meeting to for yourselves." And uh, so we we um, uh, had that meeting, and did we lose Howard? Hello. Yeah, we do seem to have lost Howard. So we're live from all sorts of different houses in our lives and struggling together. So that's part of sustainability too. Um, I'll reach out and see if we can get him back, but for purposes of being respectful of everybody's time, Mike, do you wanna switch over to your slides and we'll hear more about Guilford's exciting story shortly. Does that work? Here, I'll un- Here, Mike, I think. Yep, I'm ready, okay. I'm ready. All right, I think I accidentally muted you. Let me pull up your slides and then we'll go off and on our way. Okay. So that, that's the, oh, here we go. Yep, keep going. Okay, next. Great. Perfect. All right, let, let me know when to go. Okay, go for it. Okay, everybody, uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Tangway. I've been a sales rep for EBP Supply Solutions for uh, about 32 years now. Um, Welcome to the EBP Supply Solutions, formerly Eastern Bag and Paper portion of today's conversation. For those of you that have never heard of us, we are a third generation family and currently woman owned company that celebrated our 100th anniversary in Connecticut in 2018. We're a food service and janitorial supply distribution company that operates out of three warehouses in Connecticut, Massachusetts and New Jersey. This afternoon, we're going to talk about our views on how best to go about making sure your community's sustainability goals become a reality and a success, hopefully without exploding your budget. We're gonna focus on both food service and janitorial products and procedures. And first up is food service. They say that necessity is the greatest influence on innovation and nothing has had a greater impact on necessity than recent legislation. From specific municipalities to statewide bans, the green movement seems to have taken hold 
and real change is happening all over the country. And from what we could see, it is largely due to this legislation. The stronger the law, the deeper the changes. There have always been organizations that purchased with the environment first mentality, but many folks needed the st strong arm of the law to get them to look at their practices more closely. We receive calls daily from folks that need to change and need guidance on how to do it in a meaningful way without breaking their budget restrictions. We have a formula that we use when trying to help customers make big changes and it involves a lot of questions. Once we have all the questions answered, it gives us a much better perspective on how to assist them. Here are some of the questions and ideas that have been working for us. Does your community have specific sustainability goals? For example, zero waste, compliance with legislation, or perhaps even just the appearance of green. What is the driving reason behind these goals? Is it a new law? We have seen single use plastic bans, single use plastic bans, PFAS free mandates, plastic bag bans, plastic straws, stirrers, cutlery bans, and polystyrene bans, which is uh, number six for those of you out there reading the bottom of your containers. Are there additional influences that need to be considered? For example, town boards, community active groups, activist groups, perhaps rising expenses of disposal and tipping fees. Is there a financial reason to change, perhaps fines or penalties? Is it just for public perception? Actually, this is a common theme that we hear quite a bit. Um, that people just want to change for appearances sakes. Does change need to happen to reflect your core values? For example, should the Department of Environmental Protection really be drinking coffee out of styrofoam cups? As just a thought. Implementing your new plan is, is uh, the most difficult and uh, we always start at the end with what we say is follow your trash. So we have discovered that this is a good place to start. If a community wants to move to all, for example, compostable products, who is taking the products and what is acceptable to the actual composter? Uh, yes, you're on the right slide, perfect. Um, so if the composter doesn't take all of the items that are listed as compostable, it's a problem and it's something that you should be aware of before you head down that path. Do your waste receptacles adequately, adequately reflect what you are trying to accomplish? Now you can, turn, you can turn the page now. Is it regular trash, compostable trash? Is it recyclable trash? Is your signage and messaging effective? We see many folks purchasing compostable products and consumers throwing products away in the same ways that they always did. Is the process the same on a town beach as it, inside, as it is inside town hall? Have your employees or customers been properly trained? What is their incentive not to throw everything into the general trash? And finally, well not finally, but who is going to monitor and report and enforce the change? We do our best to make sure that change is real and sustainable, even if no one is watching. This area is the most critical and often overlooked. That's what we find. The last and easiest part of the equation, which we don't have to go into detail now, is a series of questions regarding the actual food that you're serving. Containers or vehicle product selection from the beginning makes the disposal part much easier, cleaner, and easier to enforce. There are many product choices that will do a great job and are easy to dispose of and are cost effective. Is your food hot or cold? Are you eating in or taking out? Does the package need to have eye appeal? Are there shelf life concerns? Are there other considerations that you need to think about whether or not the container needs to be freezable or microwavable or ovenable? Once you have the answers to these questions, 
specifically the follow your trash question, marketing and enforcement questions answered, your path to success will be a lot easier to see and to measure. Now, moving on to janitorial products, so we could change this, excellent. Moving to a green janitorial cleaning program on the surface should be a bit easier than on the food service side, just because people have been doing it for longer. However, there are plenty of challenges and obstacles that we see on a very, very regular basis. Third party certifications, Green Seal certification, FSC, Eco logo are a few of have are a few that have been around for a long time now, probably close to 25 years, and they have really helped drive communities to use, at least on the paper products side, that meet a minimum required recycled content standard. These products have been met with little or no resistance, as they are generally the cheapest products in the market. Green cleaning chemicals, as Ann was uh, referencing before. And equipment, however, while having been around for quite a while, are now proving to be the biggest challenge to many sustainable movements. We see the following obstacles that constantly overthrow many communities' best efforts. Perception that green chemicals don't perform as well and are harder to work with to get desired results. We call this the old school mentality. Labor-saving equipment is perceived to be a threat against jobs. A robotic floor scrubbing machine that can clean a hallway without supervision, do a consistent job, never take a break, and rarely calls out sick is viewed as a replacement to workers. An auto scrubber that can remove old floor finish or floor wax with just water can eliminate a job that used to require a team of custodians an entire summer to do. This is just another fear of being replaced. Labor-saving equipment can be expensive and require dedicated folks to be trained on the use and maintenance of that equipment. Broken equipment and sort of the equipment graveyards um, and then reverting back to old ways is a common, common occurrence. Mike this, is, Mike, this is great. We're gonna um, we're gonna wrap up this section in another two minutes. Does that work for you? Yeah, perfect. Yep. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank All right. you. So, yep. Strategies that we have found to be effective in combating the obstacles we just outlined, including the following: having custodians or facility folks involved in the decision process, effective training programs that includes continuous learning opportunities, reevaluate reevaluation of duties and schedules. We see that when folks are given an opportunity to reinvent themselves with new responsibilities, they tend not to dwell on the fear of new ideas. Purchasing equipment that is simple to use and has limited required maintenance. Establishing a preventive maintenance program for all equipment and the training of specific personnel to become experts for that piece of equipment. So in summary, everything just said, of course, during a pandemic is put on hold. We have seen the temporary reversal of the plastic bag ban and the redeployment of many custodial teams to focus just on cleaning and disinfecting. Schools have closed prematurely, have moved to summer project work in the spring to keep folks busy and productive. Equipment that does these jobs faster and easier are long on the back order list. It's going to take everything we have to get these folks back on the sustainability bandwagon once COVID-19 is behind us. We've come too far to go back to the old earth destructing ways. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. And um, just so folks know, we lost Howard before as a result of some wind gusts in Guilford that caused a temporary power outage. But Howard, you appear to be back. Am I right? I'm back. Yes, I'm back. Uh, All I'm right. Sorry. So we're tossing it back to you. We, we went ahead when we lost you, but we'd love for you to wrap up before we. Okay, go to so, so I'm going to just go to the um, end of this. I just wanted to say that engaging volunteers and, and, Connecting them to town officials and business officials is really an important part of what it's successful. Uh, and uh, and the uh, and and knowing one of the things that we communicated 
department head, this is not a controversial issue anymore, was being able to talk about the commitment and the amount of money that companies have been spending on dealing with their, making their supplies safer and more environmentally benign. So um, the task force had a, uh, once we decided to do, have a purchasing initiative, we, um, the first selectman agreed, got it, uh, we drafted a policy, did some research on towns, cities all over the United States that have, have great policies. The town, who's also the pro procurement officer, um, uh, put her two cents in, uh, used us to some degree the uh, Glastonbury policy, which was the first one, I think, in Connecticut. And the board of again approved that unanimously. And then we began meeting with department heads and working with them. Our goal is not only to the way the town buys, but to affect the businesses in the community, uh, use it to help businesses in the community, and also uh, to teach people about how they can use these kinds of products in, in their homes. So the most important thing I just want to conclude with is the things that we see as challenges and that we can work together for. One is we know we don't have the metrics and the science to make some kinds of judgments that are necessary for this. For example, how do you make a decision uh, on a product that uses a huge amount more material um, uh, and, and, and water and, and fossil fuel inputs uh, to make is one maybe much more efficient but can some toxic um, substances. Um, these are you know kinds of subjective decisions that are that that we were asked about by department heads, and we, of course we don't have answers. Um, we'd we'd um, we don't have the resources to do this ourselves, so we need to work with others. We're reaching out to the uh, central Connecticut, South Central uh, Regional Council of Governments. Uh, Guilford buys a material the Krog, the uh, capital account, and need and through the state, and we need to really work together. I, Sustainable Connecticut, ABA, ECM, to work with the state um, and, and try and influence the state because there's much what is bought that uh, we don't uh, have, the, the town is used to buying through and it's gonna be hard to change policies in that regard. We need to be able to um, start building, I think collectively, a database and a platform for sharing information about what works and what doesn't work about decision-making criteria um, that can evolve. And we were hoping that maybe Sustainable uh, CT or another organization uh, like Anne's or Mike's or uh, M might be able to lend some assistance with that. Um, and uh, we know um, uh, that, uh, that um, we need to analyze the priorities and this is very difficult because, I mean, uh, Anne uh, pointed out that we need to understand what our town buys and what are the most dangerous things to set priorities. And uh, that's an extremely difficult thing to do in Guilford and I suspect in other towns because the purchasing software um, works by vendor and not by uh, the kinds of products that, that are bought. So we are going to have to build some kind of a temporary um, uh, spreadsheet front end for the purchasing process uh, to be able to do the analysis that we need to do. And, uh, and uh, it's possible, you know, if some other town uh, has such a, such a, uh, a sort of uh, API that could plug into the front of, of a town software, that would be really, really helpful. Howard, so, thank you so much, and also okay. for your tenacity and persistence I'm in, sorry about in for sharing and coming back. Um, I'm now going to pass things off to Rebecca. Rebecca, feel free to introduce yourself while I get your sure, screen you. share set up. Um, so my name is uh, Becca Munich, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Ecology Center. And we are an environmental health organization that works at the local level uh, here in Michigan. I'm based in Michigan in Ann Arbor, and we also have a Detroit office at the state level and really at the national level. So I've been communicating with Ann for many years. You can advance to the next side. Um, through the organization, the coalition she mentioned, Safer States, which really works toward um, making sure that state and local governments have um, the tools that they need to um, 
pass policies, be they local procurement policies or state level bans on toxic chemicals in the environment. Um, so right here, what I want to focus on is um, you've heard incredible information from folks and I'm going to go really fast. Um, so we have time for questions on what's worked and what resources, resources are out there for procurement. And what we heard from folks that we've worked with here in Michigan and in other places is that people need to have a bit of a roadmap. Um, you're all starting in different places. And so what we wanted to do, next slide, um, and I'll chat out that link to the roadmap, is provide you with a four-step way of actually thinking about how do you start um, a procurement policy. And so I'm going to go through each of these steps. Um, this is available and it's an iterative process. We're always adding to it um, in terms of thinking about developing an EPP. Um, what do you need to know even before you get to developing one? How do you implement one? What resources have come out of other cities and other states and other places that you can use as a cheat sheet, if you will? There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. I think we just heard that from Howard. You know, what can we share amongst other cities? And then what do you need in terms of goal setting and measuring impact um, and training? Next slide. So the first step, this is a, a screenshot from our, our toolkit, it's all online. And each of these things go through the different aspects that we have um, for each step. So if you are brand new, if this is your first webinar, this, this is where you should start, just to learn a little bit about procurement. Um, so you can see the audience there. So maybe you're on the city's sustainability side of things, but you, have, you haven't really worked on procurement at all. If you're a procurement, professional, you may not need these things. Um, and that's okay. So you can see on the side of, um, on the right side of the screen, you'll see the resources available. So you can learn a little bit more about cooperative purchasing organizations, um, all the way to um, third party certifications and other critical tools that you'd want to get into um, learning a little bit about and watching webinars and things like that. And we've curated many of these materials for you, the ones that we at Ecology Center and Safer States have found to be the most helpful. Um, next slide, please. So after you've built your foundation, you actually have to do the hard work of creating an environmentally preferable purchasing policy. And what we wanted to do for you here is really give you some model policies that you can pull really great language from either at the local level or at the state level. And we try to have, at the local level for municipalities, we try to have smaller cities and big, big cities involved in our model policies. So, because there isn't a one size fits all, as all of you know, for this. Um, so we wanted to provide those model policies for you, um, model toolkits and, uh, and ways to put together a policy, and then some key webinars that we've curated on developing your policy. We also now have, um, that'll be going up soon, some model resolution that you can put through your environmental commission or your city council to actually empower staff to create a new environmentally preferable purchasing policy. So that'll be going up soon. Next slide. So after you've created an EPP, that's really the easy part. The hardest part, as you heard from Howard, is really implementing it. What do you do? So what we wanted to do is provide some guides and some specifications and some language of best practices and policies from other places in certain types of categories of products that you might often purchase in a city or in a state. Um, and again, we're, we're working with states and cities, so we were trying to hold both here. Um, so you can see there's um, some examples of the product categories that we have here. And then we also, on the roadmap, provide you with um, certain guides and sources where you'll have multiple product categories um, from the city of San Francisco has um, San Francisco approved, SF approved, for example, which has specifications and guidance on many, many, many different types of products. So that's a good one-stop shopping if you just need some information and you're interested in purchasing um, something that isn't already on our toolkit. Next slide. It's important to also be um, measuring and training folks on how to implement this. So I live in the city of Ann Arbor and we're a smaller city of 120 or so, 25,000 people here. And we have a great environmentally preferable purchasing policy and we have 
essentially um, 1.5 FTE of sustainability staff and one procurement official for the city. They don't have time to do as much training as they would like to do with everyone on staff that has to buy things that in our city, for example, it's, it's very distributed. So many people can purchase things. And so you have to train essentially your entire staff on your EPP. Um, so I'm gonna, to that, we are currently developing an online training module that we hope to roll out in the summer to, um, with those smaller cities in mind, um, where you can actually learn about these things. And with some generic model procurement policies, you could log on to this training, learn about what is in an EPP and how you as an office manager, as an environmental services person, whoever it is that you can imagine, in your city could actually learn about an EPP and what they have to do or change in their own purchasing to comply with a new EPP. So that's on the training side of things. Um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, setting goals and measuring your impact is really important, particularly to those of us who are going to be responding to the public or responding to our city councils um, or environmental commissions on what is the true impact of these policies. And so we are currently working on some additional goal setting information related to toxic chemicals um, and, and measuring the impact of these purchasing policies on those. And you'll see a little bit of information there um, already on our site about what has worked well in other places and that you might want to emulate. So I went through that really quickly to leave just like a few minutes for questions. I think that's the last slide. Um, so there's our next thing, uh, metrics and goals that we're developing in the interactive training module. Um, please do contact me, next slide. Um, if you have any further questions, we are happy to help at the Ecology Center. Again, we work really nationwide on this, um, so happy to talk, chat with folks in Connecticut um, and give you way more information than I could now. So there's my info. Wow. And let me chat out that link so folks have it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Becca. So we have the link there. And then at this point, Heather, if you're there, I'm going to turn it back to you. Wonderful. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And I also wanted to invite everyone on this webinar to something special that we're planning to celebrate and honor the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So I know things are really crazy out there right now, but we still think it's important to honor that as a day, um, you know, to rally around. And so we are 